Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is February 1st, 2011, and my guest is Arnold Kling, economist, author, and blogger at EconLog, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty, as are we here at EconTalk. Arnold, welcome back to EconTalk. Great to be here, Russ. Arnold, you've been writing a number of interesting posts at EconLog, trying to imagine and flesh out the beginnings of a new paradigm for macroeconomics. Those insights are what I want to talk about today. So our roadmap is to begin with what you think is wrong with the current paradigm for macroeconomics and what might replace it. Okay, so a, a paradigm is kind of like a language. Um, and I, you know, I, I think I, I want to say that out front because uh, sometimes people are looking for some dis- decisive experiment to choose, uh, to choose between paradigms. And I, I think it's, uh, it doesn't work out that way. So, a, a, you know, you can say just about anything in English and say just about anything in French. Uh, so you wouldn't say that you know English is true or French is <laughs> false or whatever. And that you know that that's kind of the level at which a paradigm functions. And the traditional paradigm in macroeconomics or over the last uh, <clears throat> certainly since uh, Hicks put it down, uh, you know, translated Keynes into this. Uh, scheme of things is aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Uh, that's so. That's the language that people use, and I want to switch to a language that uh, uses comparative advantage uh, as kind of its main core. And so that's you know that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, so your question is sort of what's wrong with the existing demand supply story? Yeah. Um, well, I think there have been there have been troubling aspects to it uh, since certainly the 1970s, when you know a lot of ad hoc adjustments had to be made uh, you know, to make this the aggregate demand aggregate supply story work. There are long-standing complaints about micro foundations, and there's a you know there's a real issue of you know do we need micro foundations or not and of course uh, Lucas at Chicago insisted that we do someone like Solo at MIT insists that we don't um, so there's <clears throat> there are those issues for me I think the 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 troubling things about aggregate supply and aggregate demand are first of all there are very few instances where aggregate demand policies were successful. You know, we've, in contrast, there are many instances of failures. You know, I would say that the aggregate demand policies that we've tried since 2008 have been failures. Um, and I would say that the Japanese aggregate demand policies have been failures, and there, there are other instances of those. And there are some surprising episodes like <clears throat> the period after World War II where there was this massive reduction in government spending, uh, but without a, uh, the sort of recession or depression that uh, would have been predicted, in fact, that some economists predicted. So there, there are just many failures uh, of predictions to come true. Now, it, you know, you, in retrospect, you can always try to fit the data to your theory. It's very maybe. easy. Even if even if the predictions didn't come true, but I, I find that troubling. Um, but <clears throat> frankly, a lot of my problem with aggregate supply and demand is I just don't like the intuition about it. I, I just don't agree that uh, the problem is some all of a sudden people have stopped wanting stuff. I, I just don't intuitively. I don't find that a uh, a very satisfying description. I think, you know, well, again, for good. non-economists, that can appeal to people. I think you know, if you don't, if you're not familiar with economics and you don't know that supply and demand depend on prices, it's possible to talk about 
perpetual excess supply or excess demand. So you know, if I were to tell a non-economist, well, China is going to really want to consume a lot more oil going forward, and uh, you know, the production in many oil fields around the world is going to uh, peak, the non-economists would say, oh, well, there's going to be an oil shortage. And the economists will say, no, no, that's going to raise the price of oil. And I think the whole aggregate demand, aggregate supply story is a story that mostly gets told without prices and is in line with that kind of non-economic thinking. So let, let's back up a little bit and go a little deeper into the the paradigm as it as it stands, for, especially for people who are not uh, economists, it's kind of ironic because aggregate demand and aggregate supply try to draw on our microeconomic intuitions about supply and demand, but without the prices, um, which is strange. Um, and one of the challenges of macroeconomics is the fact that you've got so much stuff going on at the same time, by definition. You've got a market – over here for credit and you have a market over here for dollars and you have a market over here for stuff and all three of those interact. But how they interact, of course, is hard to keep in your head at the same time, which is why people write down simplified models of these things in mathematical equations so that they can try to see and, and get a hold of these these interactions because normally you would say – well, if aggregate demand goes up or aggregate supply changes, that's going to change prices and quantities like supply and demand does. But that's not really what the – that's not the story that the paradigm tells. So uh, why don't you explain first your, what you just – go into a little more depth into what you just said a minute ago, which is that you don't like the argument. You don't find it intuitive or useful to talk about people not wanting to buy stuff. What's the, how does that argument work in, within the aggregate demand, aggregate supply paradigm? And by the way, it also has implications. We're going to have to get to these. It has implications for labor markets, which is sort of the two things that we're going to have to juggle throughout this conversation. And you and I both, I know, have been thinking a lot and writing about these issues. You have things going on in the so-called macro economy, the some sort of snapshot of of the economy as a whole, and. At the same time, you have stuff going on and people looking for work and finding work or losing their jobs, and we usually think of those going together. They're not going together so well lately. We've got uh, growth in the overall economy without much growth in employment. So that's a whole separate paradigm we're going to have to think about. I know they're related in your thinking and mine too. But let, let's talk about – let's go back to the basic idea of you know, w what's the explanation – for a recession or a depression if you're using aggregate supply and aggregate demand? Well, you know, if you, it turns out that, as I found out in some sort of back and forth blog posts with various people, it turns out that uh, this aggregate demand, aggregate supply paradigm, if you, if you push on it a little bit too hard, it, you find out that, that people really disagree what it's, with what it's all about. So let me lay out... First of all, what I think of as <clears throat> the textbook version, I, and I think this is the version that if you go back to Hicks, uh, Hicks's article, um, Keynes and the Classics, I think you, you would pretty well see this. Um, when the, so, so what is this? How can it be that people stop demanding stuff? You know, the, the Keynesian explanation for unemployment is in some sense that people stop wanting stuff and so producers can't sell stuff, and so they have to let workers go. And that's, you know, so why, why would people all of a sudden stop wanting stuff? Uh, and, you know, Keynes talked about people saving, uh, but in particular saving in a particular form, and that is holding a, <clears throat> a non-produced good, namely money. So if you switch from... So the way you think of it is if you, if you switch your demand from, from wanting to buy something that's produced, like a car or, or bread, to <laughs> wanting something that's not produced, like land or money, but let's focus on money, uh, when you switch from wanting a produced good to a non-produced good, you no longer ask for production. You no longer want stuff. And... Uh, so you know, so that's kind of the aggregate demand story. Or, or you want stuff tomorrow down the road. The idea would isn't the idea that 
you're anxious about the future, you're not sure what's going to happen. So rather than sinking your assets into stuff, you sink it into money as a precautionary uh, measure because yeah. of animal spirits. You're just – animal spirits being Keynes's term for sort of mass psychology. There's just some yeah, anxiety. Well, I, think, I think for this purpose, let's call it hoarding. I think yeah, one, of, one, of, one of Keynes's – views is that the entrepreneur who's going to invest is, is motivated by animal spirits. The saver who is going to supply savings to the entrepreneur is, uh, is interested in hoarding, and, and Keynes hates the hoarder, the person who uh, is you know, just trying for safety. Um, and in particular, when people hoard money, when they switch from, from wanting stuff to wanting money, that's a problem. Because you know, if all you wanted to do was consume in the future, then in theory you would be putting your money into capital investments. You'd buy stocks, and the firms that you invest in would be building assets for the future. They'd be building productive plant and equipment for the future, and there would really be there would not be an unemployment problem caused by saving. That is your you just change from consumption goods to investment goods. There might be some reallocation problems. Right. But there's no, there's no unemployment problem caused by uh, saving per se in that sense. It's more when people uh, want to hoard money. Um, Which is something – I guess I should back up. I said you know, Keynes, because he believed that the animal spirits motive and the hoarding motive were completely separate – uh, he w- he would suggest that the person who saves doesn't end up uh, changing the production of investment goods because the production of investment goods comes from animal spirits. Uh, so anyway, so which is somewhat uh, akin to you know, what we have right now. If you put your money in a bank right now, normally banks lend money out to investors and build and entrepreneurs people who um, want to do something productive with their money, with the bank's money. But right now, banks are sitting on those reserves. They're anxious about the future, as are the impossible entrepreneurs. So that's sort of the situation we're in now. Would you agree? Could be. Could be. Could be, um, yeah. The, I don't know if it's a lot but of but think, So anyway, you can have this phenomenon of aggregate demand falling and the you – know, when, when people express it in terms of equations, it's often as if the – you know, what they want is this non-produced good of money, and <clears throat> because they want this non-produced good, it, it, this demand for money, um, it, when they switch their demand out of demand for produced goods, you get less produced goods, less employment, you get the recession. The, the sense in which it's an dem- aggregate demand relationship is that if the price level were to fall, so, you know, the prices of all goods and services were to fall, then people's demand for money would be satisfied by the ratio of their existing money to prices uh, going up because prices have fallen. And so <coughs> then, you know, so that's the sense in which you, you have a relationship between prices and aggregate demand. The lower the price level, other things equal, the higher the aggregate demand. So just to clarify, the idea there is that your purchasing power in your pocket, the cash that you're, quote, hoarding, will now buy more stuff if price goes down so you don't have to feel you have to so keep You hoarding. don't need to hoard as much because you're, what, you, what you already are hoarding uh, is now has, no, has more purchasing power. And the stuff that you want to buy has gotten cheaper. Yeah. So that makes it so, – yeah. so, so, that, so that's the aggregate demand story. The, uh, the harder story is the aggregate supply story. Which is why is it that uh, that you get you know, why <clears throat> why is it that as demand falls you get something other than a price change that is in theory if this if this lower prices will will solve all the problems why don't we just get lower prices and lower wages and so then the aggregate supply story becomes one of sticky prices and sticky wages the idea that which I've never understood, the idea that producers are loath to lower their prices um, or that it takes a while or that it's costly to adjust prices, yeah. all of which are true. But it's hard to understand how that works uh, in a time when 
people have all this excess production, excess output sitting on their shelf. Yeah. Um, they just sort of decide to just hope for the best. I, I don't understand the micro – again, I think inevitably you have to get into the microeconomics. I don't understand what the what's going on in the heads of, of the entrepreneurs and the producers in that story. But yeah. but the, the claim among – you know, the neo-Keynesian claim, which the new Keynesian claim is that – is that it's it's expensive to change prices? I guess uh, d- downward, but not upward. Yeah, uh, I don't understand. Yeah, that. That was, well, actually, my dissertation was an attempt to uh, tell a story of that. that and uh, that there are search costs, and that people only their their people are more motivated to search when you raise your price. So you're you're reluctant to raise your price. But when somebody else is lowering the price, unless I'm searching, I don't realize that they've lowered the price, so they have less motivation to cut their price. Could be. <laughs> What's your assessment of that work <laughs> today? Um, well, it, it, conti- I, it continually gets redone. People, people, it, the, it was it was not a well. It was not published in a great journal. Was not cited, so uh, people have continued to rediscover that, me- that mechanism <laughs> for for price stickiness over the years. So there's something to that, but it's it's hard to understand how, in a time of extreme duress for a seller, that you don't lower your price. Yeah. And similarly, and again, you know, let's talk about wage stickiness. It's not really, I think, the right way to think about it. Certainly, a a, sell, a worker. Is hesitant to take a giant pay cut uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. You know, one being, it'd be nice if another job came along that d- didn't require a giant pay cut. It'd be a shame to be st- in that orig- the job you took because it is costly to switch jobs. It's a bad signal to send to employers, future employers. Um, but that's that's the um, or it, it may brand you as a low quality worker uh, if you take a low qu- a low lower wage. I guess is one of the worries. But that's the same argument. A similar argument, right, is being made in the labor market as to why the labor market isn't more normal, more clearing in the normal, in the usual sense of the word. In fact, the textbook model that I referred to assumes that prices, the prices set by firms, are fully flexible. But it, and it's only the nominal wage that's the only kind of sticking point in the whole economy. And you know there are a number of problems with that, among which is that the cyclical behavior of real wages is not as pronounced as that model would suggest. What that model would suggest is that um, all of unemployment is caused by workers not accepting lower nominal wages when you know when demand falls. Uh, <clears throat> so you would accept expect to see is uh, very counter cyclical real wage behavior. You would expect to see that when Real that when you see low employment, you'll see high real wages, and vice versa. And I, that's that's very hard to tease out of the data. Uh, so that's a that's a problem with that textbook story. Talk talk about the aggregation that's involved, um, because I like the image you use of the GDP factory. So talk about what you mean by the GDP factory and why you find it unsatisfactory. Okay, what well, the GDP factory is. What's called the representative agent model, which is that you you choose as your modeling strategy to say we all work in the same industry. Uh, so there's just one labor market, there's one output market, <coughs> there's one money market, and so on. I mean, we're making one good with one yeah, kind we're of worker. One good, and all of a sudden we decide for some reason you know that we don't want to buy more of it and then when we go to work the the plant manager says oh gosh it looks like our demand fell so i can't you know have you work as much and then so then we go home and we haven't worked as much and we say well maybe we want to demand even less and then the manager says oh well we you know, i'm going to have to have you work even less and uh, that that's a troublesome story uh, in many for many reasons. One of which is that if the um, if the plant manager were all of a sudden to pay workers in terms of output, you know, rather than paying a money wage, just say here have some of your GDP that you produced as output, all of the recession breaks down. It, it just disappears completely, which is bizarre. And to this day, you'll, you'll you'll see people argue that somehow in a barter economy we couldn't have a recession, and I think that's absolutely 
perverse. I think that's 180 degrees wrong. I think in a barter economy, it would be much easier to have recessions. Um, so, well, so far you've been talking about what I would call the a classical Keynesian model. We, we've talked about some of the uh, changes that might, um, some of the things that are wrong with it or troubling about it. And the Keynesians, you know, had Steve Fazari on a few weeks ago, who's a unrepentant Keynesian. Bless him. He's a good guy. Um, but who believes the exact opposite of you, who thinks this is the right paradigm, that that there are lots of times when people are anxious about the future, either on the production side or the consumption side, and they um, they they do hoard, they do or he- they are hesitant to take risks, and that this leads to misallocation of folks in the labor market, makes it harder to find a job. Harder to keep a job um, as w- firms and and workers uh, get more anxious, and that this is a a very common problem that happens every once in a while in capitalism. What's well, your answer to that? Um, my answer is that you know it, if you really like the language of aggregate supply and demand, and you like all those you know that way of talking about it, um, you know chances are you know, you're going to be you know, you're going to continue to be happy with it, and you're going to continue to try to find, uh, you know, to to look at the data <coughs> in those terms and to interpret things in those terms. The the troubling things I think that you'll find are um, the, the micro. If you care about microeconomic foundations, they're they can. That's a challenge, and if you look at actual predictions of the effects of policy and then the outcomes. I think you'll find those troubling. And the third troubling thing is if you go back to the 1970s, I think you'll find that that, uh, the sort of the adjustments that you have to make to get that paradigm to fit are uh, are, are troubling. So there's two other there's two other main competitors, right? That that for paradigm conversations, one and and they're they're similar, but they hate being described as similar. uh, The proponents. One would be the a monetarist position of the Chicago School that says it's all about money. It's yeah. all about either the Federal Reserve making mistakes, tightening when when actually we're we're in a bad time, or expanding when we're actually already doing well. And then there's the Austrian School that says not only is that part of the problem, that's part of the problem, but the other part is the distortion of interest rates and malinvestments that take place due to artificially. Uh, low interest rates when the Fed's trying to change things. Uh, yeah, I would say each of those you know, has this kind of GDP factory story to it um, that you really are talking about, um, you know, sort of, you know, <coughs> you're, you're talking about sort of aggregate output, although I guess the Austrian story would, would talk about different types of output in terms of... Yeah, different sectors different, expanding different, at different uh, rates. You know, Different periods of production, and some types of you know output or investment goods that yield results you know over much longer periods than others. Um, and I and I don't want to say that my view is what I, what I want to argue for is unrelated to it. How about I just sort of put the other view out there so okay. we have have the sure. two to talk about. Um, what I what I want to do is instead of describing economic activity as spending. I want to try, describe it in terms of comparative advantage. So I, I have used this acronym PSST, Patterns of Sustainable Specialization and Trade, but that really is just another way of saying patterns of comparative advantage. And so when we have a boom, what I would say is that people have found uh, a lot of ways to take advantage of comparative advantage. Everyone when people are working, they are doing something that uh, takes it exploits comparative advantage. And then when all of a sudden you better you better explain that though. Talk and I actually like patterns of sustainable specialization and trade better because especially for non economists in the audience, comparative advantage is a very difficult concept. Right. And I think specialization and trades why don't you try to put it in those words? Okay. So uh, yeah, just as a simple example, if uh, if I cook my own dinner tonight and you cook your own dinner tonight, uh, there's no ec- measured economic activity. 
involved in the cooking. They might have been in the buying the food and so on, but in, in the actual cooking, there's no economic activity. No measured, uh, no measured economic no activity. No measured economic activity. If I, uh, if I cook dinner for you and charge you for it, as in a restaurant, and then you do the same to me, so that you eat in my restaurant, I eat in your restaurant, then that becomes measured economic activity. And that may seem sort of strange. I mean, it's the same activity, cooking and eating. But if you think of it in terms of uh, the true specialization in the economy, it actually does make sense. That is, uh, if, uh, if a surgeon mows her own lawn, that doesn't count as economic activity. But if she does another surgery and then pays somebody to mow her lawn, that is economic activity. And I think that's actually right, that it would be a tremendous waste if we were to do everything ourselves. It would be ridiculously impossible. You couldn't build your own computer, build your own car, refine your own gasoline. You can't do any of that stuff. Even your own pencil, as as we know. So all of economic activity really involves specialization in trade. And that's just a fair way of thinking about it. And what we... so. Uh, you know, we measure it as spending, um, and we, but it's what it really is fundamentally is specialization and trade. And so, uh, what's happened is that these patterns of specialization and trade have become very complex. Last night, my wife was looking at an ad for a company that makes custom shirt sizes. That so they'll they'll send you a shirt. That's in a uh, that has a combination of neck size and sleeve length that isn't standard that isn't typically you know in stores. And so you know if you'd ask somebody 50, 100 years ago what would a shirt company consist of? Well, it would be you know tailors and fitters, maybe salespeople, uh, people who get um, you know who obtain fabric and process fabric. So for some reason, my wife was looking at the website to see what kind of jobs that they were offering, because they were, they were offering jobs, and it was web designer, uh, business development manager, um, customer service representative, uh, social media marketing person. So you know, it's a really strange economy that somebody's comparative advantage could be a social media marketing uh, for a shirt company. It, it just shows how complex the patterns of specialization and trade have become in this economy. Sure, and if you, know, if you, went, if you went back 500 years instead of 50, a shirt was, um, was a very different animal and was simpler. It had fewer choices, and uh, it was very different. Yeah, and you know, even even two hundred years ago, it was you know a lot of people made their own clothes. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, here in this country, so uh, you know, the, we have we have progressively outsourced more and more tasks. The tasks have become more and more complex, and the patterns of trade have become more and more complex. And we've done a couple of podcasts, or at least one, all two, really, on specialization and division of labor. And it's worth going back to the first few chapters of Adam Smith where he talks about it. And he basically says in 1776 that where, when life was vastly uh, different than it is now, but pretty a little different than it had been a thousand years before. And he made the observation that under civilization where, where these patterns are, exist, you get a lot of surplus. Because otherwise, you know, if you spend all your day making your own clothes and your own food um, – you're kind of done. It's hard to make enough clothes for yourself and for others. And what this these patterns of specialization and divisional labor allow us to do is to create enough stuff that we have enough left over to interact with each other. And that is what the market is that you're talking about when you say rather than making your own food or making your own clothes, you're you're paying people to do it. It's not just as we sometimes think of it. Well, that's easier. It, it, that whole web of interactions is what allows us to have – unfathomable standard of living to Adam Smith's time. Yeah, it's an incredible, as you say, it's an incredible surplus that gets generated uh, by that process. And um, But if you make your own clothes and your own food uh, and grow your own food and cook your own food and uh, 
make your own shoes and make sure, and keep your roof on by thatching it all the time. Um, you don't get you're never unemployed. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And right. that's it's a curse, uh, not a blessing. It turns out, but yeah. but there's a negative side to it. Yeah. Well, you know, in traditional economics, a job is not something that you worry about needing. Right. It's work is not a good thing. No, it works bad. So we but we treat it. Uh, and one of, one of the other peculiarities of, of macroeconomics is to treat it as a good thing. So we say we've got to create jobs. Oh my goodness! What you know? We, and we've got to raise demand in order to create jobs. We got to spend more. Yeah, and you know, a job in in some sense is a bad thing. I mean, what you spend most of your time doing is trying to eliminate jobs and eliminate work and make work less onerous, less risky, less painful, and so on. You know, so that, that, in some sense, that's what an economy is all about. So when we get to this, you know, patterns of specialization, sustainable specialization in trade, that's what we're, we're trying to talk about that uh, that activity. And um, you know, in the in the traditional paradigm of aggregate demand and supply, it's sort of like these equations need to be satisfied. There's an equilibrium there somewhere, and you know, sort of we just getting have to, to full get, employment is the process of getting to that equilibrium. You just have to get the the wage down. Yeah, the right the, wage. The aggregate wage. Right, yeah. yeah, the right level of spending or whatever. And But with patterns of sustainable specialization and trade, what I want to talk about is <coughs> the process of finding this comparative advantage. So how do you figure out that it's your comparative advantage to be a social media marketer for a company that sells custom shirts, I mean, how does you know how does that even happen? And it's really a case, you know, it's a case of entrepreneurs coming up with uh, ways to create and exploit comparative advantage, and then workers uh, finding those opportunities. That's what job creation is. That's what the process of you know achieving full employment involves, and what uh, and then what I want to argue is that, that that process can get confused and that right now there are a lot of <clears throat> there are just a lot of people who are in a situation where the comparative advantage relationships in the economy have changed. And so ways that uh, you could have made a living a few years ago, uh, you cannot make a living now. I mean, the classic one being a sort of extensive home building. We don't need as many people building houses as we did in 2006. We don't need as many people selling houses. We don't need as many people securitizing mortgages and trading those. Uh, and then you know, a lot of things cascade from that. In addition, there's just ongoing change that we don't need as many people manufacturing a lot of goods because we keep getting better and better at manufacturing using automated techniques. Um, so we don't need as many people. You know, we're just hearing in the news that Borders Bookstore is going out of business. Well, why is that? Is it because aggregate demand is too low, that overall spending is down? I suspect no. I suspect that the comparative advantage of having a physical inventory of books uh, in many locations has gone away relative to the Amazon model of having the inventory located in a single place, which means they probably have a lot less excess inventory. Instead of putting, you know, two extra copies of a, of a book in, you know, in thousands of locations, maybe they have eight extra copies of a book in one location. I think there's, you know, there's probably tremendous economies there. Um, plus the the explosion with the Kindle reader, or the explosion of people not reading physical books at all. You know, that's probably why Borders is going out of business, not because of a, a lack of aggregate demand. But that's that's creative destruction, right? That's the standard story that we think we sort of understand about how progress takes place, that yeah. innovation occurs, somebody invents the Kindle, um, somebody invents the ebook, somebody invents the idea of, of – the internet comes along, which allows someone to stockpile books in one location, save on inventory, great for readers, 
great for Jeff Bezos of Amazon and his and his investors who figure out that idea. Tough on, in the short run at least, the people who were investing in Borders and Barnes and & Noble and elsewhere who now find themselves uh, with excess higher costs and, and, and probably right. going out of business. But that's going on all over the economy. Right, and, and it goes on all the time. And yep. if you think of the economy as a set of equations that, that should be solved in every instance, then that should not cause... Uh, unemployment, right? You just, you know, the equations get solved and uh, the people from who were, you know, stock, you know, who were stocking books at borders, shelving books at borders, selling books at borders are now going to, you know, instantly uh, be reallocated into new jobs. That's, you know, if, if you think of the economy as a system because, of equations. Because the aggregate demand that, that left borders is now going to Amazon and elsewhere. Now there's extra perhaps money available because board, Amazon's cheaper. And so the aggregate demand shouldn't – that shouldn't be a problem. But the problem with your story, Arnold, is that that's kind of true. It is – and here's, here's my – you know, I like your story, but, but I've got some problems with it. In, in quote, good times – uh, meaning not a recession. This creative destruction has taken place every all the time. It's ongoing, and we don't have a lot of problems. Somehow, even though the person who was greeting you at the door at Barnes & Noble and restocking the books physically on the shelf doesn't have the skills to be the social media person at Amazon, which is now the new kind of job that's more uh, that's suddenly more productive than it was before – person at Amazon is going to help their Twitter account or their Facebook account stay in touch with folks and encourage sales. Somehow those reallocations just work okay and fine. So there is something uh, going on that's different today than in, say, 1985 or 1996 or even 2004 when things were – these changes were going on along – all the time. And in fact, as you know, and you've talked about this, and we talked about this two weeks ago with, with Steve Fazari, in the JOLTS data, which is job openings, what's it stand Labor for? Labor force turnover. Labor force like turnover. A survey, the, the, the JOLTS data that the Bureau of Labor Statistics collects, there's millions of jobs being destroyed and, and there's millions of jobs being created every quarter in America in good times and bad times. But what are called bad times are when the numbers that get created – are not quite as many as the numbers that get destroyed. And good times are when the numbers that get created are a little more than the numbers that get destroyed. And so for me, my challenge to your paradigm is the PSST idea, this idea that it's hard to find, and I agree with you, it's hard to find patterns of sustainable specialization and trade. But somehow in good times, we it works pretty well. So something is different. Yeah, I, I think that you know that's a a fair question, and I end up you know telling more time period specific stories for it. So, in the 1930s, I would tell you that what happened is uh, you know, that tractors really took hold on the farm, and we could basically produce all the food that we needed with. <laughs> way fewer farm workers. And so that creates this just massive uh, dislocation of, of lots of people whose skill is manual labor, and the entrepreneurs just could not figure out what to do with all this. Uh, you know, figure out the, the economy did not figure out what to do with this sort of excess of manual labor until the 1950s, uh, when a lot of this, these manual laborers had just sort of retired out of the workforce, and the people who might have been manual laborers <coughs> um, went off, fought World War II, in the process got, uh, met new, made new friendships, uh, got uprooted from their locations where they maybe couldn't have found jobs, and so in the 1950s, they come back and they work in sales or they do clerical work or they uh, work in sort of these growth industries of you know, fast food and motels. Um, 
and and the uh, the, you know, the industries that grew up around the suburbs. So my point is that the the economy that came back in 1950 was very very different than the economy that got left behind in 1930. It wasn't like you know all of a sudden get, yeah it didn't get healed. It was different. Yeah, it was just it was a, you know, a very different uh, economy and. Uh, you, you had, you know, you had many more women in the labor force, and it wasn't Rosie the Riveter in in manufacturing. It was, you know, women doing, cl- you know, in clerical work. Uh, so new, well, those... you know, you know very, a very, you know, very different ways of organizing and structuring production. And what I suspect is going on now is something like that vis-a-vis the internet, where just there are just an awful lot of skills that became have become obsolete, and uh, I suspect, you know, one p- possibility is that as of a few years ago, as of 2008, when a lot of companies looked at their balance sheets and said, oh my goodness, you know, we're not sure we c- you know, whether we'll survive, we have to really cut back to the bare bones, is that's, there was just a sudden, rather sudden discovery of this, uh, of this, the, they suddenly discovered that they had many, that they had workers who they didn't necessarily need. And so this uh, this adjustment process just sped up uh, all of a sudden. Uh, you know, that, it's an interesting idea, and it, what it suggests is that there were times when it's harder to find these patterns than, or to not find the patterns, but it's harder to to find an opportunity within the patterns than than it might otherwise be. But your example is one I think about a lot, which is the end of World War II comes along. And all of a sudden, there's a few million people who uh, are looking for work. Ten million. Now, some of them go off to college. Um, Not very many. Uh, that was that was like maybe a million out of the ten okay. million. And then you've got all these women who were and, – and by the way, on top of that, you're going to have another trend that's going to go for the next 30 years that really keeps continuing, which is not just that, that women are going to be um, – in the labor force, but a lot – it's just a steady increase in the interest in, on the part of women of working or right. or a steady set of improved opportunities that make them more willing to work. We don't know what it is. There's also a whole bunch of other things going on at the same time, the birth control pill and smaller family size and all kinds of things are going to happen over the next 30, 40 years. But over that time, we have this enormous increase though in the number of women who end up wanting to work, this enormous inflow of – very sharp increase in the number of men looking for work, and somehow it works out beautifully. It's really um, they somehow find what they find opportunities, and um, everything's good. Yeah, well, the, no big unemployment. Yeah, um, you know, I guess what you know, I, I would just have to describe that as you know, entrepreneurs got lucky and skillful in figuring out. To you know the kinds of businesses to start, and their their businesses kept rolling. And when you know, the, the guesses that they made, <laughs> a lot of them proved to be good guesses. Uh, but in uh, in 1999, a lot of entrepreneurs made some guesses about what would happen with internet. You know, in terms of Pets.com and other uh, enterprises that failed, and those guesses didn't turn out so well. And uh, in 2005, 2006, a lot of real estate developers made some bad guesses as to uh, where they could build houses and shopping centers and so on. And I think, uh, so that, you know, that's unfortunately for, it's about as good an explanation as I can give for the recession is that people made some bad guesses about where the patterns of specialization and trade would be. And then on top of that, some people, some businesses that had been kind of hanging on to uh, workers and processes, uh, kind of without uh, having to think too hard about them, all of a sudden were uh, faced with the prospect of a hanging, so to speak. It sharpened their minds, and they said, "Well, no, we're going to we're going to cut back." One of the things that we haven't touched on is is the sort of the nature of the way that workers contribute to businesses. Uh, I call that the Garrett Jones uh, effect. Of he says that workers no longer produce widgets; they produce organizational capital. And certainly, a lot of the jobs that I can think of are jobs that are not necessary to produce something or to put something in the hands of a consumer, uh, 
they they affect in, they affect things more indirectly. They affect uh, the the firm's ability to cr- connect with other firms. The the firm's ability to uh, manage its processes, to track what it's doing. Uh, so they, you know, people are building capabilities for firms, and uh, you know, so that's a, a different type of, of, of worker. And it's sort of, it's a, it's a worker that's that you hire the way you would uh, invest in capital. You make a very careful decision. You don't necessarily rush in uh, and, and bring on a worker like that. You Wait, wait until you're ready to make a big investment in new capabilities. Um, so that's a very <coughs> so that's a very different hiring process. There are a lot of fixed costs involved in that hiring process, and so you don't. Um, you know, so that I think that somehow is in the mix of of how you get a a recession and how it can be difficult to come out of a recession because an investment is something that you can you can always postpone. Uh, you may be less likely to postpone it when other firms are doing well and you have this fear of missing out uh, if you don't invest quickly, and you may be more willing to postpone it when you look around and see other firms are uh, retrenching at the same time. Well, I hope to have Garrett actually as a guest in the next uh, month or so talking about some of these issues. But let me let me challenge that, that story, and I, I want to come back to your, your previous story. Um, about post World War II. First, let me make the observation, and, and let me make the observation that the worst levels of unemployment, and this I think is true across all recessions, but the worst levels of unemployment are in the lowest skilled jobs, the people with the least education. Unemployment rates, there, there's sort of two patterns of this recession that I think are fairly, um, one part's very standard one's not so standard perhaps the standard part is that there's a higher unemployment rate if you have less education uh, we also have a very very generous uh, duration of unemployment benefits the level's not so generous but there's a fairly you know when you extend unemployment for 99 weeks which is two years it's um, that uh, does not sharpen the mind of course and it's easy for me to say I've, I've got a job so I, I don't mean to suggest that it's a, Pleasant to be on unemployment compensation. It's not. It's not. It's not terribly generous, but it certainly makes people less willing. Some people less willing to take a chance on a new job, a new profession, a new opportunity. So, but so you have that weighed over the fact that you have a very high unemployment rate among low skill workers. So that the so-called knowledge workers, the people with high levels of education, who I think of as the Garrett Jones types that you're talking about. They're not really. They're not struggling so much. They have a higher unemployment rate than than they did three years ago. It might be six percent or five percent or four and a half percent instead of one and a half. So it's up in percentage terms. It's up a lot, but it's still the case that if you're a, a knowledge type worker and you have high skills, um, you can find. I think you can find work fairly quickly. The people who are not finding work quickly. Have two characteristics. They have low on. They have low education. That's not unusual. Perhaps what is unusual is the fact that it's very geographically uh, uh, varied and different. So the highest unemployment rates are in California. They're in Florida. They're in Arizona. They're in Michigan. They're in Nevada. And perhaps it's a coincidence, but these are the states that had the largest increases in uh, home construction. Yeah, with the exception of Michigan, that doesn't fit. Well, but fit Michigan that. had a had a not so sure. Michigan did have a, a a big housing boom and bust. The parts of the country, there are parts of the country that did not. Texas, the Texas cities, I don't think had a very big yeah. boom and bust in prices. North Carolina didn't. Um, and so I suggest we might go even more micro than than you're thinking, and think of this really as an you know I think ironically we're both heading in a very Austrian direction here. Uh, you're moving away from aggregation. I'm suggesting it's it's sector specific. You're talking about entrepreneurs finding and searching for opportunities, which is you know a very Austrian idea. But is the problem perhaps not any more complicated than the following, which is that between 1997 and 2007, we built an enormous number of houses that that were not was not sustainable, as, to use your your phrase, hundreds of thousands. And if closer to a few million numbers of workers, 
were out of work because they had been pulled into that sector by the attractive opportunities. But now they're gone. Those opportunities, and they're not coming back for for a yeah. long while. The, the, the couple of problems with that. One is that the um, can I just finish because I want to I want to I want to add a I want to add a comment that a listener made to the Fazari post that I thought was very interesting. When I asked why is it that if you're an unemployed computer person in in 2001, uh, you found a job fairly quickly, but in even though there was a lot of unemployment among computer folks at the time, but in 2007. If you're an unemployed carpenter, you're in trouble. And his answer was was a simple one, which I think is very – I apologize. I don't remember the person's name. But the argument was, well, in 1999, 2001, we still had a use for people who were in computers, not just necessarily the ones they were in. And that's consistent with your story. But we've got way too many carpenters in America right now. We, there were 200,000 more carpenters a few years ago than they're employed than there are now. And those jobs are probably not going to come back for a long time. And there were only – those jobs only existed because of a really bad – a set of policies that pull people into those sectors, that sector artificially. Yeah, I think there. You know, I think that's certainly part of the story. I think the you know some counters to that are that an awful lot of you know, it, it's hard to account for numerically for uh, a very large chunk of unemployment by simply looking at construction workers. I think you have to go. It's about a quarter, isn't it? Or, maybe or an eighth? Even, no, maybe even less, depending on how you construct your time period. Um, well, I'd go from December two thousand and seven to the to the present, and the fall in unemployment. If I remember correctly, I, I apologize, I messed this up in the last podcast we talked about it. But I think we've lost. I want to say we've lost um, a quarter of the jobs that have been lost through manufacturing and 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 in in, in construction. Okay, but the, but manufacturing, it's hard to tell the housing story. Correct. That that's correct. Yeah. So you know that's and um, and <coughs> you know the uh, you know Michael Mandel has I think has a, you know recently put up some charts of sort of where the you know I, I think he looks at the total wage bill you know the the you know employment times wages where that's been uh, going up and you know it's clearly in health education and government uh, not in in some of these other sectors. Uh, so there's there's definitely these sectoral shifts going on, and I uh, my view is that a lot of it was just ongoing sectoral shifts that got really accelerated, at least on the in terms of letting workers go during this recession for reasons that I, I just would have to just tell stories about that that firms just you know <clears throat> almost like a, a, a herd behavior uh, decide well now is the time. Uh, to let work, you know, now is a good time to focus on uh, controlling costs, and it's not a it's not a time to expand. Um, and there's at the same time some shortage of, in some sense, of, of firms that were that were in the expansionist mode. The the mystery, in some sense, of what's going on right now with the high unemployment is why aren't there entrepreneurs looking around saying, "Gosh, there are all these people who could conceivably come to work." Uh, cheaply, why don't I take advantage of that? You know, find their compar- their source of comparative advantage, exploit them at low wages, and bring them back into the labor force. And then, I think if you look at that question that way, I think you know lots of reasonable answers suggest themselves. I mean, one of them is, you know, when you have to pay health care benefits, and that the cost of those health care benefits has doubled, uh, that you know that becomes a re- a real issue that um, I, you know that there's there's going to be I, I think that there are some very important secular changes and the, the health benefits maybe being the most prominent that are going to uh, reduce the uh, proportion of people who can be profitably employed going forward. But again. We always seem to manage to overcome those challenges. You could argue that they've suddenly gotten so much bigger, and they've gotten bigger. There's no doubt about it. Um, just to correct the numbers, uh, from December 07, which is the start of the recession according to the, I think, the official NBR pronouncement, to October of um, 09, so roughly two years later, Employment was down 7.2 million, and 3.6 million of that was uh, was from construction and manufacturing. So half of the job losses. Now, 
I agree with you. It's a combination of stuff. It's and of that half, one point five in construction, um, and uh, two point one in uh, in manufacturing. manufacturing. So it's a little bigger manufacturing. And as you say, that you know, we we some of that just an acceleration, maybe or productivity, uh, maybe it's something else. But maybe there's some aggregate demand story when you suddenly throw large numbers of carpenters, real estate agents, and others out of work. Maybe, maybe there is something going on there across. Well, there's, yeah. Again, you, we talk about patterns of comparative advantage. You know, if I'm not, you know, if uh, if I haven't found something that you know to exploit my comparative advantage, that's going to make it harder for you to to sell. You know, to exploit your comparative advantage by selling something to yeah, me. There, there, there is cooking. a multiplier. I'm home cooking it. and making my making my own clothes. Yeah. Right. Um, um, I do think there's a psychological issue here, and I think it goes back to the to the 2001 tech bubble burst story. If you were a web page designer in 2001, which a friend of mine was, and he lost his job, and he, within a very short period of time, found another job. But while he while he was doing that, um, while he was looking for work, he decided he had to tool up, and he got better at database management, which is what he does now. And um, that wasn't a that was that was hard. You know, he had to make make some decisions and think about what he wanted to do. He could have left computers and technology completely, but he decided that was still a good idea. And he, whether he got lucky or was wise, he still has a very uh, very good job. Yeah. If you're a carpenter in Nevada, um, you you got a tough decision to make. Yeah, well, that uh, what the way I've described that is that. Um, you know, fundamentally, the guy who was, who was doing computer work in 2000 was in a growing industry. You know, there yeah, was exactly. a very there was a, there was kind of a negative blip there, but long term, you know, there 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 have got to be more web developers now than there were at the peak of the of the dot com boom. So, you know, it was just a matter, in some sense, of waiting for. Yeah, the, the, maybe the supply temporarily got ahead of demand. Yeah, but your skills are still demanded. valuable. That's yeah. Uh, whereas the manufacturing worker in the car, you know, the carpenter, that long-term trend is only going in one direction. At least for a while. Well, it may change in five years, but it's well, going to take a long you, time. You could, you could get a, a cyclical upturn, but you know, pe- my guess is that productivity in home construction is going to trend up. You know, yep. If you look at home construction 20 years from now versus 10 years ago, you're going to see a lot less labor intensity. So, you know, the, um, you know, the way, way to think about it is, you know, long-term growth uh, in employment depends on how demand grows relative to productivity. And for a long time, certainly in manufacturing, productivity has been increasing faster than demand. Whereas in things like healthcare and education, demand has been increasing faster than productivity. So you know that over long periods of time, we're going to shift workers out of manufacturing into healthcare and education. You know, no matter how much Democratic congressmen and senators may insist that's an awful thing, we're not making any things anymore. It's terrible. You know, it's just an inevitable long-term trend. And. You know, one way to interpret the current recession is that that trend accelerated in some sense, except that the the uh, the uptick in education and healthcare is going to appear gradually over the next five or ten years, whereas the downtick in manufacturing was accelerated in the last two years. Yeah, I think that's. Um... It's definitely part of the challenge, no doubt about it. Um, let me ask you, we're almost out of time. Let me ask you an um, economics education question and a philosophy of science type question. You and I both went to graduate school in the 70s, in the mid-70s. Uh, you went to what is called a saltwater school, meaning near the coast, which is MIT, which was more prone to be a Keynesian place. Uh, I was I went to what's called a freshwater school, the University of Chicago, which is a monetarist place. Um, our teachers and the people who specialized in becoming scholars in macroeconomics, 
most of them stayed within their silos, right? If you were a MIT trained person, you tended to stay in a Keynesian type worldview. And if you were a Chicago person, you tended to stay in Chicago type worldview. As you matured and, and went on to your career, you and I have both um, moved closer together, somewhat actually, um, I think somewhere over the Atlantic, as, as Don Boudreau used to tease me, I'm a mix of Austrian and Chicago, so my home is somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. You and I have both sort of migrated uh, together in, in, in that direction. We're, we're less comfortable with aggregation. Uh, we're less comfortable with uh, elegant mathematical models that, that don't quite describe things the way they seem to be. Do uh, you see any evidence that our friends and colleagues who've stayed in more traditional approaches have found the current state of affairs uh, a legitimate challenge to their worldview as opposed to just saying, well, we just need to, you know, fiddle around with the model a little bit and make it better. And if – and what are your thoughts on where we're heading as a profession? Do you think this is going to be a landmark, uh, sort of a watershed experience that we're going through or just one that will just be like, you know, just – I'll just recalibrate a little bit? Well, my first thought is that if the if the 1970s didn't you know, wreck the aggregate supply demand paradigm, then, then what will? I think that you know, in some sense, it's easier to to use the language of aggregate demand to describe the current story. You know, you can tell a great aggregate demand story if you want. Um, you know, it, it, again, if if you push on it a little harder, it, 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 it's troubling. You know, you the Nominal interest rate <laughs> didn't go up. The um, you know, government spending didn't go down. Uh, the money supply didn't go down. So there, you know, you, but there, there are always ways to to tell stories. You can, you know, R- Robert Hall, who you know, will tell you that the you know the risk premiums stayed high. Although I'm not, I don't quite see the evidence for that the way he does, but, you know, that the you know, risk premium stayed high, and that's, you know, and that's, and then that, along with the zero nominal interest rate bound, uh, meant that, you know, uh, real interest rates were high or something. Uh, anyway, the, um, um, uh, that's the, uh, you know, so, so that, that I think that, I think they, that the people who, and the solutions like, don't seem to work the way they were purported to work. And sorry? The, the solutions that were allegedly going to fix it don't work the way they right. were purported to work. They have yeah. a story. They have a story, I understand, yeah. but it didn't work out quite as well as they'd hoped. Yeah. I mean, the story is that actually the economy was in much worse shape yeah. than we really thought. And so what we did was. It saved the right it from being even worse. It wasn't yeah. enough and, all, you know, and so on. Um, yeah, I. I I think you know again it's it's with, it's it's their la- it's a language and they can describe what's going on in terms of that language I I just I think if if you do have the ability to shift gears and to think about you know patterns of sustainable specialization and trade and think about the process that's involved in 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 creating those patterns I mean just imagine if you're an entrepreneur today okay you've got you know what? You know something like 10 million unemployed workers to choose from. You know, in theory, that ought to be really easy if you were an entrepreneur to create a business. But you know, people. But put put that hat on and say, all right, well, what business am I going to create that's going to make money? That's going to use these unemployed workers, and it's not easy to do. Um, and <clears throat> the notion that by Undertaking some aggregate spending policy, you're going to enable entrepreneurs all of a sudden to discover those comparative advantage opportunities. I think it, it, it's somewhat implausible. I, That's I, why I, I, I use this analogy of this old joke Bill Cosby used to tell. Of you know, he goes drives into a gas station. He doesn't know where the gas tank is on the car, and the service station attendant can't find it e- either. And he says, well, what if we just pour some gas all over the car, and maybe it'll seep in somewhere? <laughs> to me, that's what aggregate demand policy is trying to do relative to this finding patterns of sustainable specialization and trade. It's, it's not helping you find those patterns. It's just pouring on some gasoline and hoping it seeps in somewhere. <laughs> 
You were the, used the word sustainable. That's caused some confusion because a lot of people associate, associate it with an environmental. Yeah, word. all I mean by that is is profitable because you know the the government can certainly create uh, can create employment opportunities, but if they're not profitable opportunities, ultimately the question is how do you sustain them? They uh, or if I think of a product that you know, works for a few weeks, but after a while people don't want it anymore. That's not a sustainable... Yeah, or, the, or the housing bubble. Yeah. Um, so if you, what you, and, uh, you know, it doesn't mean sustainable forever, um, but it does mean... but Ongoing. Yeah, and I, I don't think, in, in some sense, you know, I don't think economics and environmentalism are that opposed. I mean, in some sense, you're worried about using, you know, as few resources as possible Absolutely. to produce the... Uh, Goods and services that people like, and uh, you know, the economy is trying to figure out that problem. Environmentalists are trying to figure out that problem, but from, they come at it from sometimes from a slightly different angle. But it's really there's, there's really a lot of overlap. But you know, you're, uh, so sustainable is hardly a dirty word no, in no, economics. No, I, I, I agree. No, I agree. Um, another sense, by the way, in which this paradigm is um, goes back to the classics. Uh, and by classics, I mean before Keynes, is the emphasis on production rather than consumption, which is a very classical idea and I think the right way to think about economies at large. One thing you haven't talked about and maybe, and one of the things I think that's powerful about the paradigm is we, we might imagine what makes patterns of sustainable spe- specialization and trade easier to discover versus harder. You mentioned one, you know, Various wedges of con- of kinds, things that distort or make the um, uh, potentially distort the gap between what the worker receives and what the seller has to, the employer has to pay. So uh, various benefits that might be artificially increased due to bad policies, such as healthcare, could be an example of that. But I was thinking of, of two other things: uh, mobility and information and the provision of information. You use the example of post World War II that people who had lived elsewhere now maybe found it easier not just to go back to their hometown. I think that definitely had something to do with it, and I suppose that um, the information that's available to folks today should make it easier, but it yeah. has not been enough. Yeah, well, I think another impediment that I think we have is just a lot of what I call credentialization. That is a lot of 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 industries that you could reorganize if you had complete you know, all of the degrees of freedom, you you cannot because of the laws that protect people based on credentials. So most notably, education and healthcare. Again, long term, these are the growth industries in the economy, and yet they both are very rigidly tied by credentials. You cannot redesign a healthcare clinic so that someone other than a doctor performs a function uh, without <coughs> you know, running into you know, legal problems, and you cannot organize a school uh, and get that school accredited, which is very important in this world, again, without, you know, jumping through lots of legal hoops. Well, in public so, school, you have to be certified to teach there in any pretty length of time, and then that requires a lot of hoops, many of which have nothing to do with being a good teacher. Absolutely. So these, uh, so the, the sectors where there's the greatest potential for growth are also the, the sectors that are they are most uh, rigidly held by these credentials uh, regulations, and so that I think that's a major factor in slowing the adjustment uh, in the current recession. My guest today has been Arnold Kling. Arnold, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.